first Marshall Society Speakers event of the year. Very lucky to have um, Oliver Hart joining us for this event. He won the Nobel Prize in 2016 for his work on contract theory, and he's currently a professor at Harvard University. His recent research has been on how successful divestment is as a strategy encourage, in encouraging ESG values in firms. And that's what he's going to be talking about today. It's Marshall Society Speakers event. Uh, we are very grateful to have him and um, off you go, Oliver. Thank you, George. Okay, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, there are two papers that this is based on there and you can find them on my website. Um, a bit of background then. Um, I've been interested in, for some time in, in this question um, of what is the appropriate objective for a firm, particularly a public company, that is a company whose shares are traded on the stock market. Um, the traditional view in finance and law is that such a company should act on behalf of its shareholders. Um, but recently, many have disagreed, arguing that companies should take into account the interests of stakeholders as well. And the business roundtable in the United States is among those who seem to be adopting this position. There's some question about whether they really are. Um, now, I think this view, um, it may seem uh, attractive at first sight, but it flies in the face of another idea that many people um, subscribe to, including myself, um, at least much of the time, and that is freedom of contract, which is basically the idea um, that people should be able to craft the arrangements they want, unless there are obvious third party effects. And, you know, this idea goes back at least to uh, John Stuart Mill. Um, and when you apply it to the um, corporate sector, um, the implication is that people should be able to set up companies in the way they wish. So if you think of a founder uh, starting a company, um, they are in a good position to decide how to, how to organize it. Uh, they can choose, and they sometimes do choose to set the company up as a worker or consumer cooperative or a nonprofit. Um, they can put work workers on the board, they can give workers votes, but most of the time they don't. Um, certainly for big companies, they tend to not to be set up in that way. Rather, the votes are allocated to shareholders and nobody else. And this suggests, I think, to many, including myself, that the company is, is meant to act on uh, behalf of the shareholders, the vote holders. Now, some people have drawn the conclusion, many have drawn the conclusion uh, from that, that companies should maximize profit or market value. Uh, this was famously espoused by Milton Friedman in a 1970 uh, New York Times article, uh, which has just um, you know, hit its 50th anniversary and there was a special section of the New York Times about reactions to, uh, you know, 50 years later to Friedman's article. I was actually one of the contributors. Um, and what Friedman said was that, um, you know, companies should act on behalf of shareholders, the owners. And he went on to say that their desire will generally to be um, for the company to make as much money as possible. Um, he did recognize that there are some basic rules of society, laws, and also ethical customers. And he wasn't suggesting that management deviate from those, but subject to staying within those constraints, he thought that uh, value maximization was the way to go. Now, um, in, in, in the first of the papers that I uh, mentioned on, the, on slide number two, one with Luigi Zingales, we point out that and we're not the only people who've ever said this, but I think perhaps we say it a, a little more sharply than those who went before, that um, even though a company perhaps should act on behalf of shareholders, it doesn't follow that um, that means profit maximization because shareholders are just regular ordinary people like you and me. And we're not only interested in the bottom line. Um, and even if you think of some of the major shareholders like institutions behind them are ordinary people and ordinary people um, have social concerns, have environmental concerns. For example, um, consumers buy electric cars rather than gas guzzlers, use less water in their house or garden and is privately optimal because water's a scarce good buy fair trade coffee, even though it's more expensive and maybe no better than regular coffee, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, if shareholders are willing to take social factors into account, 
uh, and to use economic jargon, internalize externalities in their private lives, why would they not want the companies they invest in to do the same? Now, Friedman arg argued against this, um, but his example uh, was charitable contributions. He made the point that at the time he was writing, um, firms were talking a lot about how much they gave to charity, and that still actually is the case. Um, and he said, you know, this is completely wrongheaded because rather than give money to charity, it would be better for the firm to take that money and hand it to uh, shareholders in the form of a dividend, a higher dividend, and then each shareholder can decide um, out, you know, can use the incremental dividend they get to um, give some or all of that to their favorite charity rather than you know there being a collective decision made by the CEO of the company, um, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, but this, uh, while this argument may apply to um, charities, it doesn't apply to other things. So um, the thing about charity, charitable contributions, is those are really completely separable for what the firms, you know, from the firm's business. There's no complementarity between those two. Um, but there are uh, many other examples where there is a complementarity. So let, let me mention two. One is, um, this is, uh, I'm afraid, a peculiarly American example. Consider a, re a re retailer that sells military-style rifles in its store. Um, now, and imagine that the owners, the shareholders, are actually concerned about mass killings. The idea that guns are used in bad ways, the, uh, these military-style rifles. Well, the, the Friedman argument would be, if it's profitable to uh, sell the military-style military rifles, then do it and hand that extra profit to the shareholders, increase dividend, and then, you know, they can use that money um, to spend on gun control. You know, that's like making their own individual char charitable contributions. But it's obvious when, as soon as you um, consider that, you realize it's, it's a crazy argument because the cost of getting the guns off the streets once they're on the streets might be much greater than the foregone profit if you never put them on the streets in the first place. And similarly, if I uh, consider a company that's uh, polluting a lake profitably and not breaking any laws, but the shareholders might be, you know, very concerned about the environment. Uh, and that's another case where the argument fails. I mean, if the company simply um, makes more money and hands it to the shareholders, then, you know, the argument would have to be that if they really are concerned about uh, lake pollution, they can go and clean up the lake. Uh, but again, um, doesn't make much sense because the cost of cleaning up the lake, uh, again, might be much greater than the foregone profit. Now, none of this would be a problem if we could rely on government to internalize externality. So um, I know, um, you, you know, you're economists. I, don't, uh, I assume, um, I mean, a famous Cambridge economist was Pigou, Arthur Pigou, who um, argued that the right approach uh, when you have externalities is for the government to intervene and use taxes. Um, so in the case of pollution or, or you know, global warming, we need a carbon tax. Now, obviously, if there was a tax that this company paid when it polluted the lake, reflecting the externality, then it would be fine for it to maximize profit because it would be taking into account the damage it does to the lake. But I think um, these days, particularly, uh, you know, our confidence in in governments is not at a high point, certainly mine isn't. And in, in some of the most interesting cases, we're not just talking about a single national government, we're talking about uh, many governments, many national governments, and the idea that they're going to be able to successfully coordinate on, uh, let's say, an optimal carbon tax seems quite far-fetched. So I'm thinking of a world where government isn't doing the job perfectly, um, and that's where the shareholders may want their firms to behave in a socially responsible way. Now, um, how can shareholders push firms, assuming they want to do this, uh, to, how can they push them to act in a uh, socially responsible manner? There are two mechanisms, um, voice or exit. This is a terminology of an economist called Hirschman. And in this context, voice refers to shareholders using their voting power or engaging with management in order to push them um, to uh, become cleaner. Um, 
exit refers to divestment. So you just decide, I don't like this firm, unless it becomes better, unless it reforms, I'm just going to refuse to be a shareholder. I'm going to sell my shares. Um, okay, and what this is what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about, the relative um, benefits of each of these strategies. Um, and let me just, before I go further, let me say that um, shareholders are not the only ones that can pursue an exit strategy. Consumers or workers can. Consumers can boycott um, dirty firms. I'm going to use the word, the terms dirty clean to reflect, you know, uh, irresponsible versus responsible. So just a shorthand. So consumers can boycott dirty firms. Workers can refuse to work for dirty firms. That's, th those are exit strategies, uh, like shareholders refusing to, to hold the shares. Shareholders are in the um, fairly special position of, because they have votes, they have another approach that what, what we here call voice, which is to uh, engage with management and maybe, you know, vote out uh, directors who are not following a clean strategy. Um, now, because time is short, um, if you look at, um, I mean, if you want the details, um, more details, you can look at this exit versus voice paper on my website. Um, it turns out it's easy for me to um, get across the the, the voice ideas than the exit ideas. So I'm going to actually focus more on them. And in fact, the bottom line of the talk is going to be that voice can be more powerful than exit, more in many cases, or at least in principle. Voices, uh, people often think about exit. I think Cambridge, I don't quite know the situation, but I think there's pressure to divest from bad companies at Harvard, there's been pressure and, and Harvard is doing it. I think Cambridge may be doing it as well. Um, and this is maybe a bit of an antidote to that because it's saying, you know, maybe it would have been better um, to uh, push management from the inside. So in order to um, explain why voice can work quite well um, um, and why exit may not be so good, but as I say, I'm gonna say more about, about voice, I'm going to impose a simple model on you. Okay, it's really simple though. Um, it's a three date model where, uh, because you really need a model to, to understand these things um, at a deeper level. So in this model, imagine that at date zero, um, there's a founder who's taking the company public. So it used, was a private company owned 100% by founder F, but she now wants to get out and she's gonna get out entirely. Um, for simplicity, we assume that, not very realistic, but we'll go with it. And um, so what she's going to do is uh, there's going to be an IPO and she's going to sell off her entire stake to um, a large number of shareholders, of, of, of ordinary investors uh, who will become shareholders. And um, you can think of them as, as being risk neutral for this. Actually, there isn't really going to be any risk in this. Um, Okay, I'm going to assume, really simple, that the company is expected to make a profit equal to 100 at date two. You can imagine that's perfectly certain, in fact, or at least it's thought to be. So um, three dates, date zero, date one, date two, there's going to be 100 pounds coming down the line. Now, um, let's assume a zero interest rate. Um, it then follows that the shares will sell for 100, right? 100% of, you know, if there are 100 shares, they'll each sell for one pound. Um, now, at date one, there's going to be a surprise. Uh, so this is not a rational expectations model, or it, it can be turned into one, but um, we don't have time for that. So I'm going to assume that um, at date one, people are going to discover climate change. It wasn't thought about at all at date zero, but suddenly it becomes a real thing. And what people learn it, is that this company is going to cause environmental damage equal to 30. Everything's in money terms. So this is 30 pounds of damage to the environment. Um, if it continues to operate in the way uh, that people expected um, using the, the current technology. Now, I want to assume that this environmental damage is spread around the globe. So it's not, it's going to have very small effect on the particular shareholders of this company, you know, who, who are living. Um, and, and only, you know, there are lots of people living that, in that country. So even if it was spread only around the country, um, you know, we're talking about, um, let's say, Britain, which is, I don't 
what is it, 60 million? I don't know anymore. But, um, you know, we're talking about uh, the shareholders. They are a small part of that. But anyway, if you think of the world, 7 billion, um, there's certainly a small part of that. So most of the effect is going to be felt by others. But it's 30 pounds of harm. Now, assume the company can avoid this by um, spending 20. So it can install a clean technology, and then there's no damage to the environment. But this costs uh, 20 pounds at date one. And the question we're interested in is, is whether to do it. Now, notice a benevolent planner. So if you had, you know, a, a social welfare maximizer, they certainly would, because they would say, you know, cost 20, you can get rid of damage equal to the 30. 30 is bigger than 20, so obviously you want to do it. But there isn't a, you know, the benevolent planner is out to lunch, uh, government isn't doing its job, um, and so it's left to individuals and companies to solve these problems. So I want to imagine that this decision, whether to go clean, is going to be decided by a vote of the date one shareholders. Now, Remember, we are interested in a world where people are somewhat socially responsible, okay? At least some of them. These are the people who buy electric cars and all the rest of it. Um, how do we model that? Well, we model it in a particular way. We suppose that you put some weight on the consequences of that decision for other people. You put 100% weight on the consequence for yourself but then you also put some weight, less than 100%, on other people, but not zero, typically. So, um, so lambda is the weight you put on everybody else, and, and the extremes would be lambda equals zero mean you're, means you're purely selfish, um, homo economicus or something, as we used to think of it, and, uh, but no, don't anymore. And lambda equals one means you're a pure altruist. You put as much weight on everybody else as on yourself. Now, just to give an example of how this works, uh, think of something very topical, masks. Should you wear a mask? You are going into the street or in a store or something like that, uh, but let's say the street, you're passing someone um, and you're, uh, you're going to be close to them for a bit. Now, let's suppose that you find it somewhat unpleasant to wear a mask, I think fairly realistic, and let's say the cost is 10. Um, maybe we're thinking about 10 pennies now, not 10 pounds. Um, but the benefit to the uh, people you pass is 50, because you're not as likely to infect them. So um, our socially responsible um, person thinks as follows, um, minus 10 to me, but plus 50 to the world, and I'm, but I weight that by lambda, so I will put on the mask, if and only if minus 10 plus 50 lambda is positive, and we get the cutoff. If, if, if your lambda is bigger than a fifth, you'll do it. But if it's less than a fifth, you know, you're pretty selfish, you won't. Now, um, I'm going to continue with this. Uh, so this is kind of the way uh, people make decisions in this model. And I want to emphasize that the people are all consequentialists. So people are doing things, they're doing cost benefit calculations, they're not um, doing something because uh, for, for moral reasons. I mean, I don't want to think, when, when, when if we talk about divestment, it's not that they're going to um, divest or, or when we talk about engagement, they're not voting because it's the right thing to do. They're going to do it because of a calculation like this. So it all depends on whether the benefits exceed the costs. Okay, let's go back to the vote then. Remember the vote is on whether this company should spend 20 and become clean. Um, now, so we've got a lot of shareholders, right? The ones who bought the company from the founder, and I want to assume they, they, you know, there are many of them. Um, I'm going to suppose that when people vote, each person votes as if she was pivotal. Now, that may seem like a strong assumption, but it's a reasonable, I think, in the following sense. Um, what's the point of your vote? It only matters if you're pivotal. In other cases, it doesn't matter at all. So if you're going to vote, and we're, I'm going to assume that the cost of voting is very low, um, then you know you may as well vote as if you were decisive. You know, it's like voting uh, in the in the in election. Um, the only time it matters is if you actually determine the outcome. So you may you may as well vote for your preferred candidate. So that's 
the what's going on here. Now, I want to consider someone, a shareholder who owns a fraction theta of the firm. So theta might be 0.01 or 0.02 or 0.001 or whatever, or it could be more. Um, let's think about the, whether this shareholder would prefer the cleaner outcome to the dirty outcome, because that's going to determine which way she votes. So um, we have the, the methodology for um, figuring this out, because here's where, how we think about it. Um, you're the shareholder. If, there was, if there's a clean outcome, the company is going to have to pay 20. And because you own a fraction theta, your, sure, your shares will go down by 20 theta in value, right? The whole company's value will fall by 20 and you own a fraction theta. So your personal capital loss will be 20 theta. Or if you like, it's the it's the decline in profit will be by will be twenty, and you own uh, you you get a fraction theta of the profit. So you're hit by twenty theta. Um, and if we go down to the last bullet point, you can see minus twenty theta. That's the first term in your calculation. Obviously, that's making you not want to to vote clean. You don't like the clean outcome from that point of view. But on the other hand, there's an upside. Okay, and the, that's the effect on everybody else or them. And that gets multiplied by lambda. Now, what is that uh, term for everybody else? Well, first of all, your fellow shareholders um, also suffer a decline in profit or capital loss. And they own a fraction one minus theta, everything you don't own. So they're hit by, uh, you know, minus 20 times one minus theta. So that's also, you know, looking quite negative. But there's also this environmental gain of 30. So that also appears in the second term, all multiplied by lambda. Okay, we go to the next slide. We see, I've just written that down again. And if you just uh, uh, take, put the first term over on the right-hand side, um, you get the formula that you will vote clean as long as lambda is bigger than 20 theta over 10 plus 20 theta, right? Because the term in brackets, you've got minus 20 plus 30, which is 10, and then you have the plus 20 theta. So that's the criterion. It's like the lambda bigger than a fifth in the case of the mask. But here we get something rather interesting and um, maybe surprising until you think about it and then it's actually obvious, which is if theta is small, that the right-hand side is very small. So if you are a small shareholder, if you own a very small part of this company, your lambda doesn't have to be very high at all for you to vote clean. And small shareholders are very common because um, these days people are encouraged to diversify their portfolios and to hold shares in many different firms. And unless they're extraordinarily rich, that means they're going to be holding a small amount of each firm. So the theta of this firm is going to be quite small, which means even someone who is hardly socially responsible at all, will vote clean. Uh, what is the intuition here? Um, it's that plus 30 term, um, or rather, I'm so sorry, it's not the plus 30, it's think of theta going being zero. Then the first term is zero because I mean, basically the capital loss you experience is negligible given that you own so little. But the, second, but the second term is not zero. And the second term consists of the capital loss of everybody else, which if theta zero is it close to zero will be about minus 20. But you've also got this social gain, the envir environmental harm is, um, which is avoided. So you get 30 minus 20, which is plus 10, and that's hit by your lambda. And as long as lambda is uh, you know, positive, uh, you're gonna go for it. And if you think about it, you're actually behaving like the benevolent planner because the benevolent planner also looked at 30 minus 20. Um, so, um, okay, so we get a result which turns out to be uh, general, if you can look at the paper, that um, a well, well device, diversified shareholders will vote in the same way as a benevolent planner. Now, of course, it's not true for a large shareholder. I mean, if you owned 100% of this company at date one, then, um, you know, lambda bigger than 20 times theta is 20 divided by 10 plus 20. Uh, we just get uh, two thirds. You have to be quite um, very 
uh, you know, pretty altruistic to vote clean if you are a, a major shareholder because you're taking a, a big capital loss. But for small shareholders, we don't have that. So this is um, the end of the first part of the paper, if not maybe even the second part. Um, and now I just want to make, there's no more algebra. Um, I just want to make a few comments about divestment because I think what you should have deduced from what I've said so far is that voice could actually lead to a very good outcome. If, if shareholders are allowed to express their opinion through, let's say, a vote, uh, they may vote in a very sensible and socially efficient way. Now, the alternative strategy for them is divestment. Um, and in order to do justice to this, you need, uh, you need to have a, a much more serious model than this little toy example. And that's what you find in the paper. But let me explain what, what base, uh, the, roughly what's going on. The mechanism underlying divestment is that if people divest from dirty firms, that will drive the share price down and will raise the cost of capital if this firm is um, going to try to be undertaking new projects. But even if it isn't, um, value maximizing managers, I mean, we often think that managers are on, on, on incentive schemes to maximize share price. So when they see the share price fall, they will be very unhappy. And what they might be induced to do if it falls far enough is to say, wait a minute, um, how can we get the share price back up um, maybe the best thing to do is become clean, install the clean technology, and then all these shareholders will flock back and our share price will go up. Um, that's the way it's meant to work. But the problem is with that mechanism is a pretty obvious one, that um, if you divest, there are other people who will buy your shares. I mean, you may be uh, very much uh, into divestment as a way to influence firms, but maybe other people aren't. Uh, uh, I mean, there may be some people like you, but there are a lot of people who don't care. And will as soon as, let's say in this example, as soon as the share price goes under a pound, 100 shares, remember the, the, the value is 100 pounds, um, if you didn't install the clean technology, um, as soon as you you know you sell your shares and the price starts going be below a pound, well now uh, because uh, day two um, a share is going to give you a pound, these other people will see a great profit opportunity and will buy the shares. You know at ninety nine p, ninety eight p, ninety seven p, they'll be jumping in because they can earn a positive rate of return, and so the price will go right up to a pound, and you will find that you just haven't had an effect on the share price. Um, and as a result, if you're someone who's divesting, um, I mean, in a more general model where people are risk averse, you will have a small effect. And so it's not quite as bad as I've said. But the thing is, you're also losing when you divest, because if you divest from dirty firms, um, your diversification uh, prospects go down. You, you are going to have to be investing in a small group of companies and, and people like to diversify. So you're losing something there. And if the impact you're having is pretty small, you just won't bother to do it if you're a consequentialist. And this is what we uh, formalize in, in the paper. So the bottom line then is that, I mean, divestment is a very indirect way of influencing companies. And whereas voice is a very direct way. And so what we're arguing is this other way may actually um, be sufficiently indirect and ineffective that people won't, won't do it. And indeed, um, here's a bit of empirical evidence, um, a study of one of the broadest divestment campaigns ever, the one against the apartheid regime in South Africa, um, I guess in the seventies and eighties, and actually, it had uh, this study finds it had no impact on stock prices. Um, okay, um, I'm going to just make a few more points, and then I'll be done. So, um, I want you to, you know, if there's a bottom line to take away from this talk. It's going to be that voice may be uh, more effective than you thought, and should be considered more seriously and exit may be less effective than you thought, but I don't want to suggest that exit is hopeless. 
because there are some situations where it can work and in and there are some situations where voice clearly won't work. So um, exit can be more effective than I've suggested. Um, if there's a campaign and this campaign changes uh, either people's information about what's going on or their preferences. So they no longer are consequentialists. Um, I, I think this is more likely to work with consumer boycotts than with investor boycotts. So we give a couple of examples. One um, was uh, the uh, boycott by black Americans of buses in uh, Montgomery, Alabama in 1955, which drew attention. Uh, you know, people should have known about it uh, uh, before, but in the United States, I think, you know, there was a much more um, knowledge that people got uh, elsewhere in the country that, um, you know, the buses were segregated in the South and that um, this was humiliating for black people and so on. And so a kind of political movement um, developed out of that or to take a, you know, somewhat um, not, not quite as um, in, important example, perhaps, um, as that one, that's very important, uh, the fur free campaign by the Humane Society. So if you have a campaign against people wearing fur, fur coats, um, one of the consequences is going to be that, you know, I might not care at all about these uh, furry animals, but I don't want to walk out in my fur coat um, because people will, um, you know, hiss at me. So um, I'm sort of shamed into, or whatever the right word is, into behaving like the people who care. Um, and that's, uh, that, that can make things much more effective. It also uh, must be borne in mind that voice can be more easily restricted than exit. So, um, you know, in the United States, um, it's made difficult for shareholders to express their views, to use voice. Um, as a, a couple of examples, um, shareholder proposes, so if you manage to get something on the ballot, uh, well, and by the way, let's go to the second thing, management, it's uh, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, which regulates these things, gives management a lot of freedom um, to block a proposal from appearing on the ballot. Um, if the if the proposal has something to do with ordinary business operations, then management can say that's not um, you know, that's our business. Um, uh, and even if something gets on the ballot, and even if it got a majority um, supporting it, if shareholders supporting a majority vote, um, it wouldn't be, by, it's not binding in the US. Um, it's, uh, so management can ignore it. Um, this is all regulation. Um, voice is also infeasible in some situations. Uh, if we take Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg, he has a majority of the votes. And so it doesn't matter what the other shareholders, uh, how they vote, uh, he gets to decide. And um, some important companies are private, like uh, uh, Coke industry. So there, if a company is private, again, um, you cannot um, um, have any influence through a vote. Outsiders cannot. Still, um, in spite of these qualifications, um, I want to emphasize the bottom line. Um, I've mentioned Cambridge and Harvard might want to rethink their strategies, go for voice rather than exit. And um, I think regulatory authorities like the SEC should um, rethink their regulations and um, start moving in the direction of making voice easier to express rather than harder. And just to end, let me notice that, uh, let me note that um, right now, there's a, a proposal from the U.S. Department of Labor, which, if passed, if accepted, I think it's out for comment at the moment. I don't think it's been um, actually implemented yet, decided on finally, but they obviously want to do it. Um, it would make it a breach of fiduciary duty for trustees of private pension funds uh, to take into account environmental social or social things um, its uh, concerns in their investment or voting decisions. In other words, it would say that you must only consider yourself with rate of return. You can't look at anything else. You can't even ask the people. Uh, so I, I would say uh, they should be allowed to ask the people who've invested their money with them whether they would like them to um, take into account environmental and social things. But this proposal 
uh, if it becomes law, would say you can't even ask them. And so I'm, I'm suggesting this is uh, going in entirely the wrong direction. Um, okay, let me stop there. Right, thank you very much. That was uh, very interesting. I had uh, quite a lot of questions actually, but you, you've answered quite a lot of them uh, already in your talk. Um, one thing maybe if we, there's been a lot of talk about divestment in Cambridge in the university, you mentioned it a bit, but maybe if you could talk a little bit more about the implications for a university, because a university is a big investor and invest. It, Cambridge I know has about four billion pounds in investment and Harvard even more. So, um, and also university is probably more likely to be altruistic as well. So um, maybe something about that. Well, um, I can, so what, what is, maybe you can tell me, I, um, I mean, most of the camp campaigns we hear about are divestment campaigns. They're not engagement campaigns. And I, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is why, why not? Why not urge Cambridge and Harvard to engage with companies and push them to be more socially responsible rather than just get out of the, of the dirty companies, um, which by the way, will leave, uh, this is not really um, quite in the, in the model I described, but um, it's realistic that the, you know, if you get out, who's gonna be in? The people who buy your shares are going to be less altruistic. So it's quite possible that uh, you will have, you know, it'll be counterproductive because the people left will will not be pushing for the right things. In fact, they'll be pushing for the wrong things. So uh, I really think this strategy, it, it's a feel-good strategy, maybe, but it's not necessarily the most effective strategy. I also think, let me just throw in another thing, which I think is um, potentially very interesting and very important, and that is that... Um, you know, some, some people argue that universities should be just making as much money as possible out of their investments, because then um, they can use that money in all sorts of good ways that, you know, in the university, um, helping students, helping researchers and all that, doing all the stuff we think is important in universities. This is very much actually uh, like the Friedman argument. The Friedman argument um, was not that um, he didn't, it, it wasn't that he thought that good work was unimportant. He just thought that that could be done by individuals so that, you know, companies make as much money as possible. They make individuals wealthy and then individuals have the resources to do good things. And that it's the same argument as for the universities. But once you take this, take um, this point of view, you realize that in some cases, and what the university has to ask is, um, you know, can I use that? Let's take my example of, I don't know, polluting the lake. So, you know, we could, suppose we could decide whether our, this company we're invested in pollutes the lake and makes more money. Um, if they do that, we can take that extra money and maybe use it on um, student fees, reducing student fees. Or we could say, please don't make the profit and we'll have a cleaner lake in, in, in Africa or something. Now, they have to make that comparison which is um, complicated, but I think it's life. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a question in actually about what are the implications of this model for privatization? And is it maybe more beneficial for, to nationalize an industry because then it will be more altruistic? Um, I don't, you know, I'm not someone, um, I mean, I believe the, the government has an important role and in some, ca in some cases it um, should own things. Um, I've written with co-authors about uh, prisons and argued that um, high security prisons should be owned by the government. But, um, but that's for different reasons. I'm not sure I would say that just because something is publicly owned that makes it more altruistic. I mean, if you think of a company which has many um, shareholders, I mean, those are, uh, you know, that uh, I agree that they're not representative probably of the country because they're gonna be richer than um, most, you know, the average person in the country, but they're still, you know, they're they're, they still are a cross section of, of, of at least some, 
you know, um, a fairly large cross section. So I'm not sure I would assume that they're less altruistic than the population as a whole. So I would prefer to just recognize that I would like to, you know, try to 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 play up the ultra or, or to encourage altruistic feelings of all of us as individuals. I don't think it has to be the government. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not really sure if I have any figures to back this up, but are perhaps maybe a lot of shareholders, small shareholders who perhaps don't get involved in the uh, business of companies very much, but perhaps they look at headlines and see if a company is doing um, dirty activities. Maybe then if they, they don't have the opportunity to voice um, their discontent. Then, then they would just exit. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, that's understandable. Um, but we argue that there are um, ways to ways to improve things. Um, one way would be um, that we could, and we discussed this in both the papers, but you could imagine a mutual fund um, arising, um, setting up, which would do the work for you. So it would, um, you know, it could be um, like, you know, in the United States, such as Vanguard or uh, Fidelity or something like this, or BlackRock. These, um, a fund like that could say, you know, invest your money with us, could be an index fund. And we, one of our purposes will be to engage with management and to vote and push them to, you know, reduce their carbon footprint, let us say. And then, um, you know, you put your money, if you, if you care about that, you'll put your money with that fund and they will then aggregate the votes of the people um, like you and will actually have some power so, you know, that sort of solves or get is a way to get round the small, um, small numbers problem or large, you know, large number of small people. Um, and, and, you know, these institutions have a lot of power. They, I mean, right now, I think they collect the three biggest, um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the US, um, um, Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street, I think they are, they own 20% of most of the big companies. Um, so, you know, they actually, um, and I think if you add in a few more institutions, you're up to 50%. So they have power. And the thing is they typically don't go back to their um, investors and ask them what they want. But I can imagine in the future, as I say, they will have stated the way they're gonna act and then people will vote with their feet in terms of where they put their money. All right, we've got a few more questions. Um, what would be the right direction for um, for the sort of corporate culture to take, which would allow uh, shareholders to have their voice heard? And it's been suggested maybe a German model of business roundtables might be effective. Um, I have to confess my ignorance. What is the German model of business? I mean, it's a question I've got in, but... Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, I know in German companies, they have two boards and this kind of thing. That's a different thing. Um, I'm not sure that's the way to go. I, I think a part of this would be um, recognizing that this sort of traditional view that money is the only thing companies should be worrying about is, is wrong. Um, so I think if, if people recognize that they, um, that owners may want companies to be socially responsible. Once you, once you um, accept, recognize and accept that, that already changes the environment and, and can, you know, who knows where it'll go, but I think it could um, by itself lead to some quite big changes. And then um, removing the restrictions of the kind I mentioned with the SEC, you know, they seem to have been put in uh, because I think historically the, Securities and Exchange Commission has regarded um, shareholder action as an inconvenience. You know, basically the view was um, managers know what they're doing. They're out there making money for the shareholders. And, you know, when these shareholders, pesky shareholders come up with their resolutions about um, this socially responsible thing or that, it's just getting in the way because it's, you know, we already know um, 
the right objective is value maximization. So, but if you, you know, this changes, I think, your perspective and you say, no, the, this is not just um, um, an, you know, an inconvenience. This may be fundamental and we need to uh, not, uh, we, 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 we want to stop stopping them getting in the way. We want to make it easier for them. So th that's also, I think, another thing. I, I want to emphasize though, that I'm not by any means suggesting that government shouldn't be doing things. This is not about, oh, let's have government out of it and um, have companies do the job. No, because we're not gonna solve global warming that way, climate change that way. It's just, I think to the extent that there's government failure, uh, companies have an important role to play, but we also need to get government to do the right thing. Um, another question. If a shareholder owns a very small proportion of shares in multiple bad companies, it might not be feasible to express voice in all of them. Is it better to divest in this case? No, I think um, you can do it company by company. I mean, even if you can't express voice in all of them, uh, first of all, as I say, through these mutual funds, you might be able to. But second, um, you know, the argument I gave, um, well, I so in the ones where you can express voice, either through um, <coughs> mutual funds or in some other way, I, I mean, this, uh, you know, my little numerical, my little bit of algebra says, do it, that there, use voice. Now, if you can't, and I suppose you could say that's like, uh, you could think of uh, Facebook. I mean, there's no point, you can't do it because uh, some, Mark Zuckerberg has a controlling stake, so you can't. So in that case, maybe your only choice is to divest. Okay. Um, we've got a question saying, the discussion so far has been very theoretical. Could you give expand a bit on empirical evidence for both exit and voice strategies. Yeah, I am a theorist, so I make no apology. Uh, it's what I'm better at. So as soon as we get to the facts, um, <laughs> there are others who can do, do them better. But in the pay, we do have some evidence. So I did mention, actually, uh, there was that bullet point about the South African divestment campaign, that it actually uh, didn't have an effect on share prices. But um, can I suggest, if you look at the um, exit versus voice paper, we have, we, we cite um, a reasonable amount of empirical work. I think the, what the empirical work suggests is that in the case of um, exit by shareholders, investors, in other words, divestment, it it's very questionable how effective that is. In other words, what I'm saying theoretically is also uh, kind of um, the facts are consistent with it. Um, boycott, consumer boycotts, um, the evidence is they can be more effective. And it may be for the reasons I also gave, which is it becomes a kind of live issue. It's in the news and people um, either, uh, you know, ashamed into it or just decide, you know, other people are doing it. So I want to do it too. And it's, it, it's, um, they do it for what I would call non-consequentialist reasons. So that, for that reason, if you look at the evidence, the evidence is more favorable to consumer boycotts. In terms of engagement, there is quite a lot of growing evidence that engagement can be uh, quite effective. Um, and it's in the paper. But I'll just mention, there. Were, I just read, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was this um, case of Rio Tinto, Rio Tinto, zinc, uh, you know, in Australia, I think it was Australia, or New Zealand, I can't quite remember. They did something um, pretty bad. They, um, in, in order to mine something, they blew up some, um, you know, some, some, I can't remember what it was, but something to do with native um, Australians or New Zealanders, native people, uh, some of their property or their, um, um, artifacts or something, or caves, maybe it was caves, I think. Anyway, it was of historical significance and great significance to them. And um, Rio Tinto just went ahead and did it. And it caused an outcry. And immediately, um, I mean, the investors didn't know anything about this until it happened. But after it happened, they were um, 
up in arms and the CEO was replaced in a, you know, a few days. And they made it clear, this is never gonna, we never want this to happen again. So this would be an example of engagement. They didn't divest. They just uh, actually used their voting power and other kinds of power to get the board to fire the guy and, and move to a different strategy. So I, it, yes, it can work. Somebody has just confirmed it was a sacred cave, which... Cave, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, right, well, I think uh, I'll, ha I'll do one more question and then we'll wrap it up. So my uh, final question is about, on its overall macro level, do you think that the corporate sector is going to be a big driver of action on global warming or do you think most of it's going to have to happen from the government? I think we need both. I mean, I think uh, ideally it will be government. I mean, I, government, as I say, whatever whatever else happens has a huge role to play. Uh, the, corp the company sector is never going to be um, a perfect substitute for government. That's just not, it's impossible given the, the sort of size of the problem. But I do think that by, with a change of attitude, the company can be, companies can become serious players in this, pushed by owners who are people mm -hmm. who care. I mean, a lot of people care about the environment. There's no reason to think that owners of companies, I mean, just think of um, people who put their pension money with, with companies. I mean, they, um, you know, they're not all uh, climate deniers. Um, so I, I, I really think the future, um, I mean, I'm, you know, I'll make no bones about it. I'm hoping that after November 3rd, uh, we have <laughs> a new president who isn't crazy and uh, doesn't deny science and all that. And that will definitely help. But whether that, you know, even if that happens, um, companies will still have a, an important role to play because, um, you know, again, talking about the US, I mean, is the Senate going to go democratic? It may, you know, even if Biden wins, who knows? There's always going to be problems with political action. And so I think we have to work on all fronts. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I think we'll bring it to a close there. I, I think um, I found that fascinating. I'm sure many other people did. Uh, we had a great turnout today, so I think that's... How exciting. many? As far as I can see, it looks like two. But, uh, <laughs> no, no, it was, it's, it's mainly on YouTube. Not, it wasn't just us two. No, there, there's other people as well. What, what is the turnout? Well, we've had, a, we've had, we had about 150 people interested. Um, At one point or another. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's been fascinating and very topical issue for people here and uh, a great way to kick off our speakers event. So, and for everybody else, we have lots of other speakers events coming up soon, so make sure we pay attention. But thank you very much, and I'll, I'll end the stream now. Okay, thank you. I enjoyed it.